Whitman said he had killed the two women to spare them from the murder spree he would soon launch. We have mass murderers who kill their families and then say they wanted to spare them, but that's usually a lie. Usually that's just something they're, they're telling themselves, but in fact, they're really very angry at these people. The nature of the killings uh, suggests rage. So these were both very violent, very close, very upfront personal deaths with someone that he professed to love a great deal. Kathy said that when, when they were first married, that he would hit her. He, she told me that. He used to really have a temper. Whitman had been taking amphetamines in the months leading up to the killings, making his frequent mood swings more volatile. In fact, Whitman had been exhibiting warning signs that he was about to crack for quite some time. Often mass murderers are also abusing substances. The likelihood that they will act out is raised because their inhibitions are lowered and their impulsiveness is raised. So the fact that Whitman was taking dexedrine meant he probably wasn't sleeping well. He probably was irritated. Already being angry, that would have just magnified his sense of the need to pay back somebody or to get revenge. At one point, Whitman even confessed his revenge fantasies in class. Larry looked up and said, Mr. Riley, Charlie's talking about taking a rifle and going up on the tower and shooting a bunch of people. And I just walked over and put my elbows on his table. I said, now that's just what an old Marine needs to do to show that, to prove that he can shoot. And he never looked up. He, he, uh, he had that little bitty smile on his face and he just kept drawing. Whitman saw a campus doctor about his anxieties and severe headaches. Once again, he spoke about the clock tower. One of the things that uh, Charlie indicated in the session was that he would like to go up to the top of the University of Texas with a deer rifle and kill people. The doctor asked Whitman to return in a week, but he never did. I have thought very much about the concept of death. When it overtakes me someday, I must remember to observe it closely. At sunrise on August the 1st, 1966, Whitman packed enough food to last for two weeks. He also assembled earplugs, matches, rope, a transistor radio, binoculars, and gallons of water. There was a machete and three large hunting knives. He sawed off the stock and barrel of a brand new 12 gauge shotgun and packed it along with three rifles, three pistols, and 700 rounds of ammunition. He loaded everything into his car and then put on a repairman's overalls. At about 11 a.m., he drove to the University of Texas campus. As a student, he was waved through security. Meanwhile, city police officer Jerry Day and his partner, Billy Speed, were sharing breakfast before going on duty. Billy told me that he was going to turn in his resignation that day. I said, no, Billy, you don't want to do that. He said, yeah, I do. He says, uh, I feel like I'm going to be hurt or killed if I stay on the force. When Charles Whitman arrived on campus, he headed to the university's clock tower, a local landmark built in the 1930s. It dominated the Austin skyline, attracting 20,000 visitors a year. Whitman parked nearby and took his equipment to the tower's lift, which carried him to the 27th floor. Below on the campus, students and staff walked around as normal. I remember very clearly uh, the weather that day. It was extraordinarily hot. Uh, it felt like it was about 100 degrees. In the tower's reception area, the powerfully built former Marine was confronted by Edna Townsley. She was a divorced mother of two who was filling in as a receptionist on her day off. Probably because she recognized him because he had been up there before and she knew he was a student and not a university employee or a repairman. He just attacked her immediately and he chased her down and just beat her on the back of the head to the point where it almost destroyed her skull. 
Minutes later, after he had barricaded the entrance to the reception area, a family of six bounded up the stairs to take in the view. As they attempted to jump the barricade, Whitman fired his sawn-off shotgun. 14-year-old Mark Gabor and his aunt, Margaret Lamport, were killed instantly. 18-year-old Mike Gabor lay bleeding on the stairs, while the others fled to the floor below. It was 11.43 a.m. when Charles Whitman walked out onto the observation deck. He took his footlocker and placed it on the western side of the deck and then went back and took the dolly and wedged it against the only door that you could use to get out onto the deck. And so he took guns and he spread them out, guns and supplies and a bunch of different things, and he spread them out in all directions so that he could run from one place to the next and shoot. The university green stretched out on three sides in idyllic summer mode, with students strolling the walks across campus between classes. August 1st, 1966 was a typical hot, steamy August day in Austin, Texas. Uh, summer school was in session on the campus. Certainly there was nothing to suggest that day anything out of the ordinary was going to go on. You know, it was a very sunny summer Texas day with no clouds in the sky and a uh, very peaceful college campus environment, you know, that we were in. At a cafe on busy Guadalupe Street, on the fourth side of the tower, Forrest Priest was taking his usual daily lunch break with friends. Well, our lunchtime conversation ran over by about five minutes, um, which I think was instrumental in the saving my life. Uh, any other day that semester, I'd have been in the middle of the main mall. Of Charles Whitman had chosen his sniper's nest with care. The clock tower's walls were more than 30 centimeters thick, making his position almost impregnable from below. Behind the imposing parapet, he had a bird's eye view in every direction. It was a spot he had thought of often. Five years before he did it, he looked at the tower and then looked at a friend and said, that would be a great place to go up with a deer rifle and shoot people. His friends hadn't taken that kind of talk seriously. Now what had been considered a joke was becoming a cruel reality. Squinting through his scope, Whitman first targeted Claire Wilson, an 18-year-old student who was eight months pregnant. If he had wanted to, he could have placed a bullet between her eyes. But instead, he went down the body and zeroed in and focused on a fetus and killed an unborn baby as his first target. The bullet pierced Claire's abdomen and killed her unborn child. As she fell, her boyfriend, Thomas Ekman, bent down to help her. He was shot as well and died instantly. Claire was left bleeding on the ground, but she survived. The first thing that I noticed was a loud report uh, from the firing of a rifle. I began to hear people screaming. Someone standing fairly near me uh, next to the student union building shouted at me that someone was on the tower firing. As he got closer, Cliff Drummond came upon a scene of pandemonium as victims dropped and people ran for cover from the sniper in the tower. The cashier said, uh, you guys better not go out there, somebody shooting a gun. He was popping out, selecting a target, focusing in on it, and firing and pulling back in a matter of a very small number of seconds. This was not the act of a person who didn't know what he was doing. It's the act of someone who is preparing for, in his own mind, a war. Charles Whitman's assault on Austin came without warning. Nothing like it had ever happened previously. There had been many mass murders in America, but their drama had been played out in private. Never before had a gunman taken aim on complete strangers in a public place and methodically gunned them down. The thing that stopped everyone and made them probably more of a target than they would have been normal.